conversation with her as a fellow docent here at the museum. And tonight we have the pleasure of welcoming Kathleen Ruse back to this forum as an environmental scientist. In her experience, that field has spanned the, has spanned the globe from our central coast here to Russia, Iraq, Thailand, Nepal, Iceland, the Pacific Islands, and most recently, Antarctica. And recently, she was she received the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award by Marquis Who's Who. And it's, is it true you are a triathlete? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that exhausts me just. <laughs> She spoke here uh, last in 2015 about the natural resource wonders of the Channel Islands and the Santa Barbara Channel. Tonight, she will compare those wonders to the unique and natural resources of the Galapagos Islands. So let's give a warm welcome to Kathleen. Um, 
Many species, over 2,000, have been because of the poor currents, which I will talk about. The rainfall here in the Channel Islands range is between 14 and 20 inches, and you know that all depends on the seasons, and uh, you know whether we have the droughts or the El Ninos. The islands were formed tectonically and through volcanic action. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we know that there are about 145 endemic species found nowhere else in the world on these islands, the Channel Islands. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Now we talk about the Galapagos. You're talking about 19 total islands as compared to 11. And with the national parks, as far as Channel Islands, we're only talking about five islands. All right. Here we're talking about all these islands, 19 islands, plus hundreds of little islands, islets, and rocks, and they're all protected. And on these rocks, there are nesting species. So, um, total mileage is uh, 1,771 square miles, so they're huge compared to the Channel Islands. They are 600 miles off the coast of the mainland. So you're talking about 11 to 25 miles here for the Channel Islands. You're just talking about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. So the mainland doesn't impact the islands as much as here. Your latitude, you can see you're at the equator. Very different latitude and longitude. You're at the equator. The depths go down to about 6,000 feet, and again, 200 feet, so it's, it can be very deep, but the, deep, the depth of the canyons are much closer to the islands than around the Channel Islands. Now, what's unique about the Galapagos Islands as compared to the Ch Channel Islands, even though they're both, <coughs> they're both very te tectonic in development and also volcanic, the Galapagos are located right over a hot spot, a molten hot spot within the Pacific, and it's very active right now, as we speak. And the island of Ferrandina and almost Isabella are right over that hot spot. So these are volcanoes coming up from the depths. Uh, and you have a plate, a tectonic plate, moving over that hot spot. So that's what makes the Galapagos a little bit more unique. Oh, well, I shouldn't say more unique, but different. <laughs> this is the Nazca crestal plate, moves over, it goes southeast, it's called the hot spot. And the islands are considered on a, a conveyor belt. A little bit different, even like the um, Hawaiian Islands are considered a chain, and they're moving, and they're over, they're, they're doing the volcanic action too, but they're not on this conveyor belt, uh, the same as the Galapagos. <clears throat> the rainfall here is about two inches. So remember going back. So everybody, so that was the perception of a lot of people. They say, oh, you're going to the tropics. It's going to be this island tropic. No, it's not. It's a, it is very dry. As a matter of fact, when Darwin got there, he said, it is hell on earth. When, when the, uh, the, uh, war, I forget, I'll get his name here, but I'll, uh, his name just escaped me. But when he first saw that, the guy that first discovered the island, when he first saw it, he said, this is hell on earth. He said, get me out of here. <laughs> and he was stranded there, and a lot of his crew died. So uh, very, very active islands. And uh, actually very, very much endemic islands as well. So here's the discovery. And this is Father Thomas Forlonga. That was the name I forgot, Forlonga. He was the one that said, this is hell. Let me get off this island. Um, or islands. He was blown there because he was going to meet with um, uh, the Bishop of Panama, and he got blown there by the currents and the winds. Winds are very, very powerful, just like the winds around here. Uh, but it carried him out to the Galapagos. They were stranded there until the winds changed and they could escape. But as I said, several of their crew were, were um, died because there's no water. And on a lot of the islands, very different than here at the Channel Islands, where you can find water to some extent, there's no water on the Galapagos. So you see the difference in discovery, 1542 by Cabrillo in Channel Islands, 1535. Uh, very, very similar in time frame that these islands were discovered. The Spanish were very active, <laughs> moving around. Uh, who discovered them really? Channel Islands, the Chumash. Nobody really knows about anybody before um, Berlanga getting there. We do know there were a lot of pirates and buccaneers after that time, and whalers. Those are the people that used those islands. As far as natives, it was too far to get there. And there wasn't water, there wasn't anything that they could really eat. So it's not like you had native populations like you here at the Channel Islands, you had the Chumash. It would be a very, very different scenario. And then we go through this, the Arlington Man and Pygmy Man. So a lot of different discoveries on these islands. 
And you hear, you have Charles Darwin getting to this island where he actually arrived in 1835, September 15th. Uh, now the Channel Islands, they both became a park. Galapagos became a, a established as a national park in 1959, but it took them many years to actually get park service people and develop the park because they just don't have it. So it took them until 67. Uh, the acreage here is 3,000, over 3,000 square miles for the Galapagos Islands. Down here, but 97% of Galapagos is protected as a national park, though I will tell you it's very populated on some of the islands. All right, uh, the Channel Islands was listed in 38 as a monument and then became a national park in 1980. And you can see the difference in mileage. It's just some of that comparison. Age of formation, this is a lot of information, so I'm just going to show you a slide. Trust me, I'm not going to go through all of this. But what this slide is really telling you is the Channel Islands are actually much older than the Galapagos Islands. You're going back to 30 to 40 million years as far as the rocks. When uh, Tanya Otwater, she's the famous geologist in this area, when she was down in San Diego, she's looking through these streams and she goes, I've seen these rocks from the Channel Islands. So that's really where the Channel Islands were never connected to the mainland here, but they were connected to the mainland down in southern San Diego, but they were underwater. When we had this Farallon plate, plate tectonics, you had the Farallon plate moving towards the North American plate. The Farallon plate was moving towards the North, North American plate, but it subducted under it, which means it moved down under that plate, which gave the Pacific plate, which was moving this way, and yet the North American plate moving this way, it pushed this whole area up from southern San Diego, pushed it up and out, and moved it in this east-west direction. So that's why when you go all the way to the San Gabriel, to so Santa Monica Mountains, out to the Channel Islands, everything is in an east-west direction, where all the other mountain ranges in California are north and south. Pretty cool? Yeah, it's very cool. Especially if you're taking what walk waters look at that. Like, These are Channel Islands rocks. I know that. <laughs> so let me go back here. So then, you know, this is how they actually formed. Um, then you had some lava, obviously, lava flowing over. And up to about 5 million years ago, you had the lava flowing over that movement of that land off of the mainland, off of the crust here. And that was, and that's what actually formed the islands of Anacapa and uh, Santa Barbara, are very, very volcanic. As compared to the Galapagos, are less than 3 million years old, up to 5 million years old, depending on the island you're talking about, so just moving across the conveyor belt. All right, they're very, very young in geologic time. They're like the Hawaiian Islands, they're just forming. Um, actually, they're even more recent than, than the Hawaiian Islands. The Nazca Plate slides over that hot spot, I'll show you that, and this gives you the age of some of these islands. Ferendina, that little tiny island that I just spoke about, is about 300,000 years old. Now, in geologic time, that's like a baby. <laughs> you know? So you have this Nazca plate pushing this way. See, it's moving somewhat south, southwest, southeast, excuse me, southeast, and it's moving against the South American plate. And then you have the Galapagos Islands right about here, right over that hot spot. So I just threw this in here because this is a relatively recent photograph showing the seismic activity going on under the Galapagos Islands right now as we speak. So uh, you can't go anywhere in Ecuador and look at paintings. So they look artists on the streets. Every painting they have has volcanoes in it, and they're active volcanoes. And that's because they live with active volcanoes all the time. They just had a recent eruption in uh, 2015 with Wolf Volcano. Ferendina is actually an active volcano. So I just thought that was pretty amazing. And just giving you, showing you the Channel Islands compared to the mainland here. And this is showing you the volcanic look of Anacapa Island. This is Inspiration Point. I think many of you have been there. And go back again because it's absolutely breathtaking. Okay, this, this is, I went too far. All right, and this is a snapshot of the Galapagos Islands. These are very old. This is the oldest island, Escola. Cristobal, San Cristobal is a very populated island. Very populated island. 
I was actually taken back by the populations on some of the islands when I got there. Big airports, modernized, a lot of people, because the tourist industry has grown, and so you need a lot of people to support that, and more and more Ecuadorians are liking the fact that they could move out to the, the Galapagos. So it is impacting some of these islands. All these islands, however, even the populated ones, are protected. But like the Channel Islands, we move the people off. The ranchers are kind of much gone, other than having some uh, space that they can come back to once in a while. These people probably won't be gone. Oh, I do want to go back to your. And here's your baby island, about 300,000 300, years old. Now this is what the lava looks, this is what the islands look like. And this is what most of the newer islands from uh, Isabella, uh, they look uh, just like this. This is called Aha Lava. The blocky pieces on the top are called blocky lava. And this kind of little flowing lava here is called the Hoi Hoi. All right, and then I will show you a little circular kind of lava. This is the Hoi Hoi. See how much more flowing it is? Right? And these terms come from Hawaii, obviously a very active volcanic area, but they use the same terminology. And the other one, oh, this is where the Hoi Hoi cracks off. And this is like on an island in Jambisi, um, where these plates break off and they kind of move up and down. The storm petrels actually form nests under those. So it's uh, unique. They use everything. Everything becomes something. Here you can see a combination of the blocky, ah, uh -uh, and the Pohoihoi lava, and then you see the unique uh, Galapagos cactus found nowhere else in the world, endemic to the Galapagos. And this is that circular, uh, tubular type of lava that forms, and they form these big tunnels under the islands, and you'll see that. You can go to Hawaii, and you can walk into these deep tunnels, and you find that in the Galapagos, you can go up into these tunnels, and you can walk for miles. And there, there are tubes. The little tubes, that, little tubes, and they're big tubes, that the lava keeps flowing through, and then it condenses, it gets smaller, and, and constricts, and then forms these tubes, and they form pretty much habitats unto themselves in these tubes. Lava cactus, endemic to the Channel Islands, to the Channel Islands, excuse me, to the Galapagos Islands, they're kind of the only thing you're going to see breaking through that lava. That's the first thing that comes through. And here was this blade of grass. You say, oh, there's some grass. Well, that's from some seeds from somebody's shoes. <laughs> and that's how it gets there. And that's one of the problems for these islands. This is the old Punta cactus. As I said, and what's unique about this cactus, as you'll see down here, it's bark. It's bark like a tree. And so like you just like you can't you see this the green cactus and then you say, but there's bark. You don't usually see that on most cactus. So and then you can see all the lava. So very, very dry. You can see there's less than uh, two inches of rain a year. Uh, Darwin even said it was uh, he he related it to hell on earth. Nothing could be more un uninviting <laughs> until he got onto the islands and went inland and went to the older islands and saw some of the vegetation and saw that where that when they got older they turn into much more vegetated tropical islands. It takes a while, but then those islands are dying. Uh, this shows you the salt brush in the back. Salt brush is very similar to our version on the Channel Islands of Coriopsis. It looks dead all the time until you get a little bit of rain, and then it turns into this beautiful, beautiful green. So that's um, that salt brush. Now, the, why they're so unique is the converging cur currents around these islands, around the Channel Islands. And I'm not going to go through all this as well. This is very detailed, but I did do my homework. <laughs> so you have this cold, low salinity, very high subarctic current coming down from the north for the Channel Islands. And then you have this California current bringing this very warm water up from the depth and up from the south. And then you have this really deep undercurrent coming also, which is very, very cold. All right, and then you have warm saline central North Pacific water coming in, and then you have this mixing zone all the way around your islands. So you're going to have northern species, you're going to have southern species, and then you're going to have the species that would normally live in a Mediterranean type climate. So you have it all, and because it's bringing, because of the depths of this, uh, the undercurrent, uh, you have this huge upwelling, upwelling of nutrients, and that nutrient soup feeds pretty much everything all the way up to the blue whale largest mammal ever known. 
This just shows you what the upwelling looks like. Now the converging currents of the Galapagos, there are more of them. There are about five currents going through here, and I'll show you what that looks like. This shows you the distance of the islands, but the mainland doesn't really affect it nearly as much as uh, the channel. South Equatorial Current is coming this way. Then you have the Panama Current coming down, the uh, Caribbean Current, the Humboldt Current, and the Cromwell Current is very, very cold. So you have all these currents converging all around the Galapagos <coughs> Islands. Even the very tiny, tiny island of Arvida, which is, just looks like a rock, there. It just looks like a rock, but if you go down underneath, and they just found this out with that record data, it goes down two miles, all right, and then it spreads out into this huge, huge structure that goes for about 20 miles. So when, the, when this uh, Cromwell current comes in here and hits that wall, it just pushes everything up. So again, you have all that upwelling, a huge amount of species coming to the surface, the phytoplankton, zooplankton, everything to feed just about everything that's in these waters as well. So, yes, you are at the equator. <laughs> and I'll tell you, they do some experiments down there. If you go, go to Ecuador and go right to the equator line, and they'll stand you on the line, and they'll do experiments that will blow your mind because it does affect our biological systems. The electricity in your body, the balance in your body, you know, you have all these circadian rhythms going on, you will, you will be blown away. But I'm not going to get into that. All right. <laughs> so here you can see the, the tree trunks here. And these cactus, this is amazing, but the tortoise actually eat those cactus. They actually eat the spines. You can actually see them crunching down on the cactus. And so did the iguana, the land iguana. <laughs> this is Wolf Volcano, which just erupted in 2015. Um, it's, it's, it looks like it's very active. It just kind of has that look about it. All right. And the next thing we talk about were when the ocean comes to land, what exactly happens? Well, in the Channel Islands, we have these wonderful kelp forests that grow two to three feet a day. We're the most active forest in the world, the fastest growing forest in the world. All right. And then, but the, but the Galapagos Islands, we don't have any kelp but we have mangroves. And there's about seven different species of mangroves. The most common one is the red mangrove. Um, and they're pretty amazing too, because this is where you shelter, you know, you have all that upwelling, right? And then you have all these species on the land and in the water, but where do they nest? Where are they, where's their nursery? Well, it's in these. This is where baby birds, baby fish, baby benthos, baby lobsters, baby everything are born here, or this is their nursery. So the unique species to the two archipelagos. Obviously, these you don't see too often. <laughs> but these you don't see too often either. All right? And they are endemic to their own place. Channel Islands has just as many unique species, well, not just, just as many, but many unique species on these islands, from the Santa Cruz scrub jay all the way down to our gopher snake, which is found nowhere else in the world. It is a constrictor. People say there's no snakes on the island. Well, there is on Santa Cruz, and now they found them on Santa Rosa as well. And then the Galapagos, we have a, a lot. So I'm going to go into some of those fun things, if that's okay with you. Yes. All right. Uh, I don't want to talk about these guys because this is too depressing, but they all experience a lot of invasive species, and usually all caused by humans. Now, things, some things come in accidentally, and still going on today. But most of the sheep and the cattle on both of these things, the elk and the deer and the pigs, and were brought in on purpose. They were brought in for a purpose. They wanted to have ranching and stuff. So they've all been removed on the Channel Islands. You know, we went through a huge restoration here on the Channel Islands to remove all these. We actually had to remove the golden eagle because it came in and started feeding on the feral pigs first. Once they got the feral pigs out, started feeding on the island fox. We were down to 14, 15 fox on, on um, Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Island, endangered species, and had, something had to be done. Now, rats were not probably brought in on purpose. I don't think people brought in the pet rats, but they came, they came in with the people. And then we do have a lot of dogs and cats were brought in, especially on Catalina. Same thing out here on the Galapagos Islands. Now, there are only certain places that they allow you to have your dogs and cats, but still, it is still a problem, and they have pictures of dogs getting iguanas and that type of thing. So as of 2005, they took off all the goats on 
the islands because they were decimating the islands, just like they did here in the Channel Islands. But you had, and that's why you were impacting your, dead, your Galapagos tortoise to the point where we only had 12 tortoises on some of the islands. And that's a serious problem also. <coughs> This is showing you the diversity by island in the Galapagos. You're not going to find the same species on every island. The islands are so very different. And I think a lot of you have heard about Darwin's finches. All right, those finches are different because they're different on every island. <laughs> so it's going to be a whole different habitat on these islands. So this just gives you an idea of where some of these, um, these species are. It's very diverse. And here comes my favorite guy. This is, this is the Galapagos land iguana. He's absolutely marvelous. I know people have told me he's an ugly creature. I can't see it. I just see it's the most beautiful creature I've ever seen. Next to my dog. No, he's, he's huge. He's big. He's, he's, a, he's a big guy. He's a big guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he's armored, and he's smiling at me. He's not mad at me. They are very friendly. Uh, and this is another quote from Charles Darwin. He said they're slow, sluggish, and ugly. He was talking about the marine iguana. Uh, they're not. They're just friendly. They're not afraid of people. That's why they seem slow. Uh, but when you kind of come up to them, you can see them move pretty fast. Uh, this is just a couple of pictures of my... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> is he great? It looks, it looks like he's smiling at you. <laughs> they, are, they are so... Prehistoric, I can't believe it. Um, and this is, and this is showing you the, the trunk of that cactus out there. And I've said they eat that cactus, they eat some insects, but they swallow them up, they'll eat it. Uh, but mainly they feed on, um, you know, the cactus. Now, this is, I told you how dry it is. And it was very, very dry when we were there. But you did have some mist. And just like the Channel Islands, if we didn't have fog, these islands would be doomed. You have the fog, huge amount of fog around there in the misting, and some of the little water droplets form in these lava rocks, and this guy was taking a drink, and it was just beautiful. And he was not going to leave his little drinking hole. <laughs> this little tiny hole. It was, it was, I was going to put this in a video, but that's too hard. <laughs> so. Magnificent creatures, aren't they? And this is, uh, there's three species of land iguana on the, on the Galapagos Islands. This is Pallidus. Uh He's the blonde guy. Uh, you can see he doesn't have that gnarly look on, at the top, uh, but he is one of the species out there. And there's also a pink iguana. It's only found on, uh, uh, in the Wolf cal the Caldera. These are called shield volcanoes out here at the, at the Galapagos. They're all shield volcanoes. And he's only found out there, and they won't let anybody go out and see him because he's so endangered and so protected. And why exactly he's pink? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's why. Uh, this is just showing you the land iguana with a mockingbird, which they're they bother everybody. Uh, now here's your endemic. <laughs> this is the one that, that Darwin was referring to as ugly and sluggish and slow until he saw it move in the water, and then they move. They are just like moving. They're beautiful. They're just, it's, it's amazing to see them move in the water. Uh, There's just the tail, the legs go back, and they just gracefully, they can dive up to 40 feet, they can hold their breath for over 20 minutes. Only the big males, only the big males dive. They feed on algae only. That's the only thing that they feed on. So El Ninos decimate these guys because it wipes out the algae. There's nothing there for them to eat. And you'll see them, they, you can see dead ones crawling up and they just die right there because they can't get back. The other thing about these guys is because they can hold their breath just so long, and they're a cold-blooded species, so they have to get back to land to warm up. They feed, and then they try to get back, and they have to go through this gauntlet of the sea lions. And sea lions <coughs> like to play. They're not going to hurt them, but they like to play with them. So they grab them, they pull them around, but if he has to get back to land, he's going to die. So we have had this happen. I see some light rock here where you can see the iguanas, and they're everywhere. They came back from that El Nino. But on the black rock, you can't, you almost can't even see them. You're just, you're walking along and you're, oh, and there's thousands of them in front of you. Uh, and they will come like this and they will all sit up and they have a happy little family. They're just... <laughs> and this shows you how the El Ninos do affect them. And uh, the other, the other organism, the other animal, very, very much affected. I shouldn't say that. I was going to go 
back to our iconic bald eagle. There are no bald eagles at the Galapagos. It's a truly North American bird. But this is another restoration program that has worked very, very well in the Channel Islands. You know, this bird was decimated from the Channel Islands. It was endangered. There was none of them left on the Channel Islands because of DDT, the pesticide, mm -hmm. all right? Affected the eggs. It did that with a lot of birds, peregrines, all the birds. <clears throat> so this is a good news story. And the rehab for this bird, the restoration for this bird, started uh, at the same time as for the island fox. And they kind of ran at the similar times. So we have some really super iconic people here that aren't found at the Galapagos. But going back to, and this is the other, this is the uh, Galapagos hawk, and this is their iconic bird. This is the main predator on all the islands, is the Galapagos hawk. When we talk about what is the main predator, land predator, on the Channel Islands, yeah. our island fox. <laughs> oh, I was going to, I didn't get to my island fox. I will go back to, this is the other species, this is the Galapagos penguin. And this is the other guy that is very, very um, impacted by El Ninos, seriously impacted. And every time in 82 and in 97, 98, when we had the, El, the major El Ninos that affected us here, uh, decimated these populations, and they have not come back like iguanas. The iguanas have come back, these guys have not bounced back. And the reason being they're thinking it's because of the rats. The rats on these islands are coming in and getting the eggs before they can hatch. So uh, Darwin Station is the big research facility out there, and they are working at killing. They can't kill every rat, but they're working at killing a percentage of the rats that they know the penguins will survive. So it's a, it's a, a question of numbers. So he's a little guy, and I just came back from Antarctica, and I can tell you the gentoos and the adelis and the Chins rats are pretty big birds as compared to these are little guys. They are little guys. And if you're snorkeling and you're diving out there, you will be swimming with them, you will be swimming with the flightless cormorant, you will be swimming with sea turtles, and you will be swimming with just about everybody just diving down around you and they don't even they consider you're there. They just dive right around you and it's, it's a wonderful experience. So guys, this is my largest, this is, I thought this was coming up for me. <laughs> Uh, this is your largest land predator, this is the Galapagos hawk, and on the Channel Islands is your island fox. Now the, the main story that I wanted to, as far as restoration, was comparing wildlife restorations, and I mentioned the, the island fox and what we've done as far as restoring that and the bald eagle. Well, it was a very similar situation with the Galapagos tortoise. They were down to 12 to 13 tortoise on... Um, I will find it. They're down to, uh, oh yeah, it was on Espanola, right. Uh, they were on Espanola Island. I did that to remind myself. Uh, and, and that was because they took like two, 200,000, 200,000, uh, the, the tortoises were taken over 200 years because they are a food source. Uh, they were taken by all the whalers, the buccaneers, the pirates, even uh, Darwin and their ship, they took 45 of the tortoises. They stored them upside down on their shelves. They don't have to eat for a year. They don't have to drink water for a year. So it's a perfect food source. It's got a lot of fat. And so they were taken totally for food sources ever since the islands were discovered. Uh, so the populations were very, very impacted. Darwin was actually told that the shape of the shell was indicative of where that, uh, where that tortoise was found. You either had a saddle type thing where the, the saddle came up behind you and that meant the turtle could actually reach up and grab that high cactus and then you had one who could graze down lower like on Espanola Island and he didn't have to lift his head up high. So these were very, very indicative and all these things started striking Dr. Darwin's like, why would they be so different? Well, they're different because of the vegetation and the food source that was on these different islands. But this one, this story is very similar to the uh, Isle of Box in the fact that they all were down to 12 of the tortoises. Uh, they had 12, 12 uh, females, one male, 13. And then they brought in a desert tortoise from San Diego uh, to start a breeding program. And I met the guy that was in charge of this program. He started it in 1998. Cruz Mezquez, I think his name was. Uh, so it, this is a very, very successful thing. You can go to Darwin Station and you can see the breeding of these tortoises. Remember the females are what, at 20, 29, 28 degrees, 28.5 degrees and has to be, and the males are only formed if it's 29 degrees. So they're only like a fraction of a temperature, but that 
it determines whether it's male or female. Uh, here's your island fox. Oops. And that's a similar story with the 14 or 15 when they started the breeding program. And this guy was supposed to be a little video, but I don't think he's going to work as a video. Oh, yeah, he is. <laughs> so this is, this is what they do. They, um, they kind of do this. They hiss. And this is a female. And she's yelling at him for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> survive during the droughts, and the little ones that feed on the little seeds don't survive during the droughts. 
and vice versa. So it really depends on the island, depends on the season and what's going on. And, and they're in their embryo stage, they're prepared to develop a bee depending on what's going to happen. And so these genes that switch on and switch off, and the Hox genes and all those things going on, it's, it's amazing stuff. But here are all these finches, Darwin thought they were different birds when he sent them back. All right? And then later on, the, um, we found out that one of the finches was the one they call the vampire finch, where it's got a very sharp beak, and when, it's, when there's drought, it will peck the tail feathers under the swallowtail gull and drink its blood. Oh my God! Yeah, they yeah, oh they their survival mechanism. They yeah. peck, they bleed, and uh, they drink the blood. Then there's the woodpecker finch, which actually pecks just like a woodpecker. It's got this right beak for pecking, but it doesn't have the same tongue that a woodpecker has, so it can't get the larva out. So it makes tools like Da Vinci. <laughs> So I just had to get my Da Vinci out of it. So it not only does he use a tool, but he fashions the tool so it will fit in the tree and it will plug into the larvae that he's trying to pull out. And that's a bird. So don't ever call anybody a bird brain again. <laughs> and there's a couple other unique ones uh, that uh, are just pretty amazing. <laughs> just show you how uh, Darwin fit in on all this stuff uh, evolutionarily. When he came up with this theory, there was a lot of people involved in, in developing that theory. But then this is one of the first things he saw that was so unique on the islands was the flightless cormorant. He's looking at this cormorant, and he's seeing all these cormorants swimming around. And he's used to cormorants because they're very common in England and stuff. And the, then these guys get out of the water, and they got these stubby little wings. And he's going, what is the matter with this bird? Well, they have evolved into the fact that they only feed in water. They're like penguins. They only feed the water. They're also very, very impacted by El Ninos. And when they are in mating time, they have this really beautiful blue eye. And it's gorgeous to see them up close. You can see his blue eye here. They are heavier birds than our cormorant. They're a little bit heavier. They're the largest of the cormorants. They have bigger feet because that can make them swim a little bit better. Like our cormorants, uh, they have oil over their wings, but their wings are not waterproof. So, and that's a good thing because when they dive, they soak in a lot of water, it makes them heavier, so they dive deeper. And so they get to stay underwater because their wings become waterlogged. That's why when they come to the surface, they do all this hanging out there, <laughs> drying out the wind. <laughs> so, I mean, it's amazing to see this guy standing out there trying to get his wings dry so he can go uh, dive again. These guys dive deeper than our cormorants here. Our cormorants can go down to about 30 feet, 40 feet. I'm fish, they stay very close to the land, so these guys, um, these guys can go to 100 feet. They're like the uh, shags or the pelagic cormorants. So this is showing you the difference. If you can see in the, in the wingspan, see how the wings are? This is your Galapagos cormorant, and this is our cormorant, double, double crested, and this is the pelagic. He's, he's another one, he's much smaller. And he can, he can dive, this guy can dive, the pelagic cormorant can dive, and he's found out here. He can dive over 100 feet. But he's unique because when he comes out of the water, because of the positioning of his feet, you know, when you see cormorants, they're struggling to get their butts up, you know? He just could shoot right out of the water and go right into the air. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everything is designed for, for a purpose. I just show you this slide because it shows you the salt, salt brush here, and then all the lava fields going out here to the ocean. This site was the site of, if you saw the movie Master and Commander, this is where it was filmed. This is where, you know, the guys playing Darwin, Bethany, whatever, he walks over and he looks and he sees the, he's loving catching all these organisms. And he looks over and he sees the French ship, remember, in the background. He's got to leave all his specimens and then run back and tell the captain, duty. <laughs> There's a French warship. This is one of my favorite guys here. I'm trying to move ahead, but you can see blue-footed booby, iguana, and a swallowtail gull. He's a nocturnal gull, the only nocturnal gull there is in the world. And they're all in the same place. And a little bit more, but this isn't a very good video, but I got the rock through the wall. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of hanging off the side of a cliff here, guys. <laughs> Feet are blue. Well, it's the carotenoids that are in the fish that he eats, and the 
term booby comes from the Spanish word called clown because they look so funny when they're doing the ma mating dance. Their feet are very big and they, they want to show the females their blue feet. Well, the carotenoids go to the feet instead of going into their bodies. Now, he's, now evolutionarily, you say, well, that's probably not a good idea because carotenoids are really good for your immune system and that's where you want them to go. But when you think about it, because of mating, the carotenoids make his blue feet even bluer. So if he can mate, because he's got the bluer feet, that is a evolutionarily a better trait for him to have than going into his immune system. So it's the same thing for the red-footed booby. He, he feeds red-footed booby feeds further out, a little bit smaller bird, and he has different uh, organisms he feeds on, so his feet are red. But the same practice goes on. And you see that little swallowtail gull here with the red eye? That's a beautiful gull. They only come in pairs. Um, they're a unique gull. And here's a beautiful picture of the blue footed booby. Now, I know they don't look as elegant on land, you might say, but if you see them in the sky and then you see them all dive at once, they don't dive once and choose these like our, our pelicans dive. They all come down at once. And they just make their bodies into arrows and they just pierce the water. And they're they're absolutely wonderful divers and great fishermen. Now here's your blue-footed booby. Now this is the other, this is called the mask, mask or Nazca booby, like the, the Nazca plate. This is the Nazca booby. He's a little bit bigger. Um, and this is the booby you've probably heard about that practices cyclicide, where the, the one, they lay two eggs. They always lay two eggs. The one that develops, uh, within uh, four to five days before the other one, when the second one develops, he gets pushed out of the nest with the mother just sitting there and she does not do anything about it, gets pushed out of the nest and just dies. It's guaranteed, right? It's gonna die. Whereas the blue-footed booby, they lay two to three eggs and they nurse, they, they share on the nesting, they share on the feeding, and they raise all, all the chicks that survive. For whatever reason, the Nazca booby does not do that, and there's two reasons they're believing that is why, evolutionarily. Um, either one is the second egg is a guarantee if the first one doesn't hatch, or they found that um, in the next year, the level of effort for her to try to maintain two eggs is beyond what she can do, because they've actually forced them to maintain the two eggs, and they've done it over time, and then the next, the next years, she's much weakened, much more weakened, and she can't reproduce as well. So it, it's kind of an amazing scenario, but people, when you see it, it's, um, it's kind of a horrific sight. Yeah. You know? And there's your uh, swallowtail gulls. And I, I did want to show you one thing about them. They are, um, they are swallowtail, but they're the only nocturnal gull. I think I did tell you that. And they're found on most of the Galapagos Islands, but they only nest on the island of Rovito. That's the one I told you that went down, straight down two miles and then spread out. And you, it's very, very difficult to get on that island. Uh, obviously, we have sea lions at the Galapagos, and they are the, they're very similar to the California sea lion, only they have evolved into a smaller species. So obviously, at one time, they did swim down there, but because of the food source and because of what they need, they're smaller. Oh, and I didn't mention the whole reason that those little penguins can get there. They, they migrated millions of years ago. They swam from the Antarctic up to the Galapagos, but they can survive there because of that cold water current. And that's the only reason they could survive there. And they're doing, they're doing relatively well, except for El Nino and the rats. If they take care of the rats, they'll do okay. Here's a great diversity slide. You have marine iguana, you have a Sally Lightfoot crab, and you have your sea lions. And on top of that, there was a cormorant, but I didn't get it all in. I think these are beautiful, these are locusts, and they're beautiful species, and they happen to be mating, so. <laughs> uh, this is your dove, Galapagos dove. It's found only on the Galapagos. Uh, this is where we found that Galapagos. This is a, a beautiful area. You have some fresh water here. You can see that salt brush in the background. And I have to get to the waved albatross. I know we're running out of time, but a little bit smaller, has seven to eight foot wingspan, where you know the wandering albatross goes to eight to nine feet wingspan, largest wingspan of any bird in the world. Um, this kind of bird. And they are truly amazing. They only nest on one of the islands here. Uh, they weigh about 11 pounds. They have a beautiful mating ritual, very similar to the wandering albatross. 
they do make for life, but they're not monogamous. So they fool around somewhere else. <laughs> but they do come back to the same nest. Uh, they go through this beautiful, very romantic mating dance. Uh, and they do look for each other. The thing that's amazing about the waved albatross or Galapagos albatross, found nowhere else but Galapagos, and the wandering albatross, is that when the parents get older, when they they can go up to like 60 and 70 years old, these pairs, uh, when they reach like 35 years old and 40 years old, they really, really super nurture their chick. They only have one egg, and they are super good parents. They both share the feeding. They travel for miles. The wandering albatross even goes further out than how far. Then they have to go for hundreds of miles to get food. Right? Yeah. Their biggest enemy and what's killing them, a thousand, uh, one thousand. 1,000 a day, I think it is, are killed. Uh, 100,000 a year, 100,000 a year are killed by longline fishermen. Uh, so their their saving their savior was Prince Charles. Uh, he he really when he was in the navy, he really loved these birds. So he set up this whole worldwide thing to look at uh, new techniques to do longline fishing that were, would protect the birds. So he's very active in that. But besides, they only have the one egg. They are very, very good parents. They nurture their uh, parent, their, their chick. And you know that this chick is ready to go by the time these parents take care of it. So when they're 35, 40 years old, usually these, these parents die right after that because they put so much energy into that raising that chick. And they've done that for many years, but when they're older, they actually just do more. And now there's somebody you don't expect to see. Flamingos, and the flamingos, these are now native to Galapagos Islands. They flew there uh, hundreds of years ago. I've been told two places, from Panama I was told, and I also was told from Chile. Don't exactly know where they flew in from, but now they are Galapagos flamingos. They stay there, they mate there, uh, and this is their, uh, it's just something that really surprises you to see uh, in this kind of desert climate, these flamingos. And your Sally Lightfoot Club Crab, uh, which is everywhere. They're everywhere. And I cannot go on without talking about the frigate bird. The great, the great frigate bird and the magnificent frigate bird are both found on the Galapagos Islands. They have a very bad reputation. They're called pirates. They're thieves. They, and they do. The only way they really can feed is to steal food from other birds, because other birds are much better fishermen than they are. <laughs> they cannot touch down on the water, which is one reason why they can't fish that way because of their wings. But because they have to stay in flight, like the albatross, they are actually they can actually shut down half of their brain. Shut it down for a while and keep gliding and not touch down and then turn the other side. You know, sperm whales can do that. Some of the sharks can do that. And we had a researcher out here where she actually had electrodes on their heads and she was doing this and they showed her shutting down of the brain. So um, yeah, they do steal from everybody else, but they're pretty magnificent when they're flying. But then this is a guy in the mating, his mating uh, dance where he blows up that big red pouch out in front of him. He stays down on the ground, he spreads his wings out, he blows up this pouch, he keeps looking up at the sky, you know, doing this whole big thing. And she flies up there and she looks at the, she, the biggest and reddest pouch is the one she wants, and then she comes down and I'll mate. So we can't go without having a snake. There are, there's one snake on the Galapagos, and this is called the racer snake. It is only a three-foot snake. It's a constrictor. Uh, it was made famous very recently. If any of you watched, uh, I don't know if it was Blue Planet or Blue Planet 2 or one of them, where the racer snake comes out after this female iguana who has just laid eggs, and she's trying to get to the ocean, and they come after her. And it's very gnarly. It's wonderful film footage, but you will hate these snakes after watching this video. You will just, you will not like these snakes at all. And they're wonderful snakes. They're very friendly to people. They're non-venomous and very similar to our gopher snake, which is found on the Channel Islands. Uh, they thought it was only on, found on Santa Cruz, and now they found it on Santa Rosa also. I just showed throw this in because this is a Galapagos hawk, which is actually catching a fish, which nobody has. People tell me they don't fish, and I said, well, there it is. <laughs> so he got something. Uh, on islands, this is kind of an interesting thing, but you see when you go to the populated areas of these islands, even on the Channel Islands, you'll see all these uh, orange flowers and red flowers and all these different. On islands, usually they're only white and yellow. 
On the Galapagos Island, they're the only bee there, the only pollinator for, is really the carpenter bee. It's a big, giant bee, the black one, the black, the salt black is the female. Uh, the one that has a little brown body on it is the male. Uh, and they only will pollinate yellow flowers. They have, that's what they do. So islands usually only have red, excuse me, yellow and white flowers. And then on the Channel Islands, you'll see the morning glory are usually only white. All these other colored plants have been brought in by their ornamentals have been brought in to decorate somebody's land, the landscape. Landscape, excuse me. So you can see the yellow also. So their future of these islands is really in our hands. Uh, the, they're all famous for being isolated. I will tell you, I was very, very surprised to see all the population of what I saw when I got down to the Galapagos in, pop, in the populated areas. Now, they do an excellent job in our, the national park. All the park, 100% of that park is protected by the park. And you go out there and you won't think there's anybody else out there and because they do such a, such a good job. But more and more people are going all the time because they're becoming very famous. Invasive species are a serious problem on both of these islands, and we keep, you know, when you think about the size of the aircraft that have to go into the Galapagos Islands to actually feed all the Ecuadorians and all the people that live there now, and supporting that population, things are going to go over to that island, that no matter how much you try to protect Antarctica, they actually made us take off all of our bags, our baggage, our camera cases, they vacuumed everything out, they did everything to try and keep anything off of Antarctica. Well, they don't always do that on these islands. Um, they're protected by the national parks, uh, but there's increasing tourism. Galapagos had over 100,000 visitors every year. That's more now. And the Channel Islands has just bragged to having over 350,000. 350,000 this year. Um, it's great. It brings in business. It's great for commerce. It's great for the area. But you got to, you just want to think about, is it really great for the islands? Uh, so with all these people coming in, uh, you can see it increased from 2,000 to 2,005 to 30,000 people on some of the islands in the Galapagos. They've both been called the Enchanted Islands, and that's because of the mist that forms around them. And they've, they've both been known this in history, and when you read uh, different literature, they've both been referred to the Enchanted Islands, and they are. They're both Enchanted Islands. They both form through the volcanic action and tectonic, Action, the Galapagos are much more recent, very, very active uh, islands. Um, the cold and warm currents that mingle, you have five currents coming in around the Galapagos, you have three currents coming in around the Channel Islands, but because of those currents, the cold and the warm and the mix and the deep currents, the huge upwelling that pretty much provides all the nutrients for all the species that we have out here. Um, very, very diverse throughout the different islands. Similar history as far as discovery and time frame and the introduced species here. Uh, the natural selection, what Darwin talked about, it wasn't just Darwin, uh, Alfred Wallace, he did the same thing, only he went the other direction. He went to the uh, Malaysia archipelago. Uh, he actually told Darwin that he came up with kind of the same theory, theory that Darwin came up with, and Darwin got really, really surprised. Well, he had his theory like 30 years ago, he just never published it because he didn't. Well, there's a lot of reasons. One, he was very religious. He was very respectful of his wife, and he didn't think this was going to go over too well. He was, he was a very, very um, popular, well-read, very financially settled guy. So bringing up Origin of Species that he published in 1959, he finally let it out when he knew Alfred Wallace was going to kind of come and scoop him. He talked to Lyle and his buddies at the, and they, they presented together. They both presented together. They became lifelong friends. And as a matter of fact, when after Charles Darwin published Origin of Species in 59, uh, Wallace published his book and he called it Darwinism. Nice. So, and if you go to England and you go to the places, you can see the pictures of each other because they really admired each other. Uh, Alfred Wallace was much younger. Uh, he was, his voyage was 15 years. <laughs> he was on a boat for 15 years. And this is after he was on a boat one time and he's doing all the same research and he had all these specimens, the boat caught on fire. And he lost all of his stuff, barely rescued, his hands were all burnt, and he said he would never go back to sea again. And they were on 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Uh, it's kind of, so the, some of those, the things that were Darwin discovered and they looked at on the difference of species diversity and the origins of species and how they change from different islands and 
how they change over time and how they evolve. He saw that coming down from Argentina with the armadillo, and he found fossils, and he compared that with the turtles, with the, the tortoises' shells, and all those different things. And now we're finding the same kind of investigation going on on the Channel Islands, which is pretty exciting, you know, because it is the same. Maintaining and protecting these islands, whether it's this archipelago or the, the Galapagos archipelago, is microcosms, it's kind of a crucible of studying life, but it's also, with the Galapagos, it is the life and death of islands. You're forming an island almost right in front of us. They're forming, and then they're dying as they move. As a matter of fact, San, uh, Ferrandina has moved. These islands are moving two inches every year. If you estimate that back to Darwin's time, uh, Ferrandina has moved over 30 inches. Just slide across. This looks large. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I think that's my presentation. And, uh, Swim over. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. It's it's it. You know, this is it's one reason I bring this up is 